Good evening and uh, welcome to tonight's lecture uh, at the North of England, uh, England Institute of Mining and the Mechanical Engineers. Uh, without delaying too much, uh, we'll conduct our short procedural agenda, beginning with uh, apologies for members' absence. Uh, does anyone have any members' apologies? I know I have Rick Smith. No, uh, I don't have any apologies at the moment, Steve. Uh, oh, shall I no. go on to our, our last meeting? Um, yes, please do. Uh, it was given by Dr. Hanny Hughes of Camborne School of Mines. We had a uh, very good attendance. Um, and since then, it's been very popular on YouTube as well. Uh, we had some excellent questions from the audience, especially one from John Theobald, who um, highlighted a few issues that had been occurring down in Balby uh, back in the day to do with uh, gas explosions along the shale beds. And uh, I believe Hannah and John are discussing this further. So hopefully that will be an excellent research output for us there. Uh, the vote of thanks was uh, given by Norman Jackson and closing remarks by the president. Um, any other comments, Steve? Not at all. No, no. Take, that, take that as a record of the meeting in that case. Indeed, sir. So our uh, next lecture, uh, we'll, we have a special event in April, but our next normal NEMI lecture will take place on Thursday the 20th of May, and this will be by Professor Stephanie Glendinning of Newcastle University, and it's, uh, the title's to be confirmed, but it's going to be on long linear geotechnical assets and how you can uh, monitor them uh, due to the increasing complexity of the infrastructure we have. Uh, but our big event for next month is a two-day conference joint with the Durham Energy Institute, uh, and this is to do with the Northern Energy Transition. So we'll have one day one is predominantly sessions that have been organised by uh, our institutes. We're going to go through the geological record of climate and extinctions. We're going to have a session on the geology for the energy transition, uh, predominantly coal mine um, water heat down in places like County Durham, uh, but also to do with critical metals as well. We'll also have a session on materials for the Northern Energy Transition and what local companies are doing and manufacturing in terms of advanced materials in our region. And finally, our, our, to end the day, we'll have a session on COP26 organised by the Durham Energy Institute uh, of potential outputs from the conference. Uh, on day two, we'll have some representatives from local government, a three-minute thesis competition given by PhD students from across the region, and also a keynote speech by Anne-Marie Trevelyan, MP from Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, and I'm sure many of our members uh, will have a number of questions for her and we'll round off the conference with clean energy and man manufacturing solutions, including steel and uh, perhaps le what low carbon transport could do for the region. This is a public event. We'd love to see as many of our members and as many members of the public uh, come along, actually listen to some science and hear what might be going on. And you also have an opportunity to ask questions as well. So do make sure you look it up. It'll be on our social media uh, and also our websites and make sure you register via Eventbrite. Don't forget to follow us online if you want to find out more information about all our events. Uh, we're at Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we'll have a back catalogue, increasing back catalogue of lectures on our YouTube channel. And also don't forget our website as well. And don't forget, if you're interested in hearing more about our events or joining in with our Zoom events, uh, don't forget to go to miningstitute.org.uk for us. That's membership and uh, sign up. We've got a range of lectures and conferences, an annual dinner with men and women of uh, professions range of professions. Uh, we're working on some CPD and we also usually in normal times hold field trips as well. Uh, so don't forget we've got plenty of excellent benefits of membership so please do go and look that up. Um, yes so just just to answer your question David yes it's a live event and we'll be sending out the Eventbrite sign up link uh, shortly uh, so you'll be um, able to ask questions on the day and submit them beforehand as well I believe. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'll hand back to our president and uh, who will do the introduction for Professor Martin Dade Robinson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Uh, well, we have great pleasure in introducing tonight's lecture by uh, Professor Martin Dade Robinson, who is co-director of Hope for Biotechnology in the Built Environment with Northumbria University. Martin specialised in design computation with a special interest in synthetic biology and firstly studied architectural design at Newcastle University. 
followed by uh, an MPhil and a PhD at Cambridge. His early career was specializing in information architecture, comparing physical and digital information spaces, where he was nominated for the uh, Royal Institute of British Architects Research Prize. Developing an interest in synthetic biology, uh, heralded as one of the eight great technologies, he recognized the gap between scientific state of the art and design speculation in biotechnology and became interested in uh, bridging this gap. After completing an MSc in synthetic biology, he built a, a research group taking a human centered approach to synthetic biology, his work receiving widespread media coverage, uh, and is editor for the Routledge book series uh, Biodesign and also over 50 peer-reviewed uh, publications. Um, I'm not going to say any more, uh, it's taking too long. Uh, so now may I hand you over to uh, Martin Dade Robertson uh, to give us uh, this very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, um, my talk today is going to be reasonably informal. So if people want to ask questions as I go through, I'm, I'm happy to take them. If not, then I'm, I'll be also happy to take things at the end. But um, you gave the introduction so well, I don't really need to do this slide, which is very helpful. So I'll skip back. There. Yes, all of the, the things that you've heard are, are, are roughly speaking true. Um, so I have this dual background, uh, an, an odd background, I guess, in architecture and um, computing and then synthetic biology, which is a field that you, you may or may not be aware of, but we will talk about that as I go through and the implications of that. Um, I'm here representing, I'm sorry for the low resolution slide, but I'm here representing the hub for biotechnology in the built environment. So we received funding just uh, under two years ago um, from Research England to set up a new research centre across Newcastle and Northumbria University. And I'm particularly proud because it's one of the very few examples of a really a proper collaboration around a single research theme across those two institutions. We, we need to, should work together much more. Um, we set it up with the idea that um, there's an emerging field of biotechnology that's coming along in all kinds of aspects of life, medical, uh, medical technologies through to um, uh, um, uh, chemical technologies and so on. But there are huge challenges in the built environment that could potentially be solved in um, with uh, novel biotechnology. So we, we got together, so uh, myself uh, leading for Newcastle and colleagues over at Northumbria University who were involved in biotech, put together a joint bid. Um, the short of it was we won eight million pounds. And since then we've been building a new facility. Uh, we're now, we went from six people, we're now up to 50 people at this point. Um, many of whom I've just been on a Zoom call with. Um, and we're split into four main research themes at the moment. So building metabolisms, living construction, microbial environments and responsive interactions. I'd like to talk about all of them, but I'm gonna focus just on one of those themes today, given given time constraint. The overall motto of the hub is for, to, for the development of future built environments, which are life sustaining and sustained by life with an emphasis on that last bit, the sustained by life bit. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us the research that we're doing particularly interesting, I would say. And I lead um, the, the living construction research theme. So I'm gonna talk through that a little bit today and give you a glimpse and very short glimpse really into just a few of the projects that, um, that we work on in that theme. Before going any further, I'd like to say that um, this is a huge collaborative effort. So um, I, I have a, a large research group at this point. Um, some of the names of those research group are on the board right now. These are some of the work I'll be referring to, the, the students and um, researchers whose work I'll be referring to most of all, uh, and my collaborators as well. So I collaborate across a range of different fields. So I have civil engineers, um, biologists, microbiologists, synthetic biologists, um, architects and designers of different sorts. And our research is, I'm pleased to say, really well funded at the moment. So we, we have have a number of different projects in different research um, funded streams and I'm very unusual I teach architecture I teach how to design buildings but I have um, a, a category one lab um, that I run so it's it's not completely unique in the world certainly very rare to find this kind of facility in that kind of context um, we are setting up at the moment you'll note the lab is quite empty that's because we we can't get back in very easily right now um, but we're we're getting there so the lab is is ready it was also a big day for us today because um, we're building an experimental house and I'm aware I don't have a slide on this and I, I will for future but we're building an experimental house um, called the Ohm on the Newcastle University campus. This is gonna sit just behind the Great North Museum. The steel work went in the last two days. 
I'd say steel would not be our first choice of sustainable materials, but it has to be steel for lots of different reasons. Um, and it's going to be a really unusual and interesting building that we hope to open up in May and will become also partly public as well um, over the next year or so. So there are lots of exciting things happening. So just to place this um, work in a little bit of context for you, and I, I, I'm aware I'm speaking to quite a diverse audience here and so some of you may be aware of this kind of research some of you may not be but I'll just place it in the context for you so probably one of the key emerging areas in, in architecture and building design is uh, digital fabrication um, and it's it's uh, whilst it's not mainstream in construction yet there is uh, the thought that digital fabrication will become uh, much more uh, prevalent in the future of construction I'm showing two buildings here quite contrasting but similar in many ways are buildings that come about as a result of the coupling of hardware and software, computer hardware and computer software. So the top building Bilbao is enabled because uh, those forms can be made because the, the drawings can be made and then translated directly into CAD CAM uh, using a process very similar to the way that uh, they design and engineer um, jet aircraft or any kind of aircraft actually uh, to create these bespoke forms. And um, that's not a cheap building by any means, but it's a building that wouldn't have been possible um, 30 years ago, for example. And it was a pioneer of its type in developing this direct link between hardware and software, the manufacturing of the building components and the software they used to create them. The image on the bottom left is a bridge that's been in construction the last couple of years in China, in Shanghai, um, from a group at Tsinghua University. It's a 3D printed bridge, so it's uh, using concrete which has been 3D printed, extruded out, and then assembled on site. Uh, those members are completely load-bearing, so as I understand it, there's no uh, specific reinforcement in there. It's been designed specifically to be 3D printed, and then rolled out in that way. And 3D printing of buildings, so using uh, the technology that we've seen on the desktop uh, allow us to make things and extending them to the built environment is, is really prevalent. One of the interesting things about digital fabrication in design, um, architectural design, is that there's also a kind of an in, implicit link to biology. And this happens in two ways. So um, people are interested in biomimicry. So the top image is uh, um, one of the uh, pavilions, a yearly pavilion um, from Stuttgart University, a group um, led by Akin Menges. And every year they take an inf in inspiration from nature, from a structure, um, for example, a beetle shell, looking at how the materials are structured and then translating those into a digital fabrication method and fabrication, fabricating them on site. In this case, you see the robotic, ar robotic arm behind there, stringing up um, carbon fiber, fiber uh, kind of a carbon fiber sewing process almost, a winding process to um, over a frame. Um, and the other area is biointegration. So the image on the bottom left is uh, by a, um, an MIT based academic uh, called Neri Oxman. It's called the Silk Pavilion. Um, so the, 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 it consists of an um, aluminium frame, which has been wound with uh, silk and then has been seeded by, with a, a, um, a thousand silkworms. So effectively what the silkworms do is then complete the structure. So they're making kind of secondary structure by crawling over this structure and then filling in the canopy effectively. So it's a concept piece for how you can integrate a biological fabrication process through the silkworms with the digital fabrication process, in this case, robotic manufacture. So in my group, we see biology slightly differently to those, those other people. So we see biology as potentially wetware. So we describe it as wetware in the same way that we have hardware and software. And as wetware, biology, um, and so whereas these other fields have emerging technologies, enabling technologies, so typically the relationship between software and hardware comes about through software like CAD CAM and parametric design, material based design computation, where you can do modeling and form generation in software and then translate that directly into, for example, the, um, the machine path of a robot or a, a large scale 3D printing process. Um, in wetware, we have the same Principle. So we have enabling technologies and specifically synthetic biology is my interest and more specifically microbial synthetic biology. So synthetic biology uses a range of different techniques, um, including things like jet genetic engineering and systems biology, computational methods for biology as well. Um, to, to essentially engineer microorganisms to be agents of fabrication to fabricate materials. I'm going to discuss, talk about that in more detail. So we're very focused on the wetware bit. Um, and our, our general question is, is a, a big one. So the, the question I asked my group 
um, I would ask them every day, if I saw them every day, is can we grow a building? So can we go from constructing a building to growing a building? Imagine popping a seed in the sand, in the ground, and your building then grows, self-assembles, organizes itself, use the resources available to it um, to, to, to turn those resources into energy, to turn that energy into matter and produce a building. So that's a very big aim. That's a science fiction aim, but that's something that governs a lot of our thinking and our research. So... I guess more specifically, I would say that in the built environment, we tend to use materials after those materials. Uh, we do use biological materials a lot. So we use timber, we use limestone. These are the results of biological fabrication processes. But we use those materials after the organism that created them has died. So if we can start by making materials using the, the, the capacity of biological systems to grow, then we have a range of materials and process and construction processes that, are, that have never been available to us before. So we start with wetware. We take what we call a biological based, uh, um, biologically first approach. Um, and we mainly focus in two types of organism, microbes and fungi. And I'm gonna go through those in a little bit. So when we think about these fabrication processes, we think about biology make things in different ways. And we think about four categories, or actually I suppose three categories of the way that biology make things, and a fourth category, which is how biology might help us make things. So when, when biological systems make a material, and think of yourself in this regard, because you are, after all, a biological system making a material. You're made of a material. We've made of many different materials. We think of um, the materials that make up biological systems as either constituted. So these are materials that are made of living cells. Um, so most of you are made of living cells, for example. So that that it, it, you, your your tissues form are formed from cells. Those cells are part of a fabrication process that makes you. They are produced by living cells. So there's some materials that are made by living cells, but ultimately they're exported outside those cells and have a life of their own. So they become an, what we call an extracellular matrix. Or materials are induced by living cells. So they are formed through some change in the environment caused by the cell. And usually that's a chemical change um, that will then make the material self-assemble. And then finally, materials that are made active by the inclusion of a biological agent, by the inclusion of a cell. Um, so this is not necessarily a fabrication process, but is the way that we could use cells within our own materials. So for each of these, I'm going to give you an example of projects that we're working on in each of these sections and how we're trying to make them relevant to the built environment. And a lot of this is very early work, but I want to try and project to you that, that potential future. So starting with constituted, um, we work with a material um, uh, based on mycelium. So if you've not come across mycelium before, my mycelium is the root network of fungus. So if you've eaten the, the mushroom bit, um, the, most of the organism lives uh, in, underground usually or within wh whatever substrate it happens to be growing in, in this very dense and complex network of roots. Um, they can often go on for miles actually in, in, a, in a forest, for example, if you see the, the mushrooms popping up, chances are there's a really dense network of these fibro this fibrous material underneath. It's really interesting as a material because you can cultivate it. Um, and if I were just talking to a mushroom farmer about how we use the waste from their mushroom growing, because it grows so densely that you actually get quite a decent bulk material at the end of it. It's so even a bulk material that has some um, compressive strength. So you can make compressive materials with it. It's also a really good insulator. So it's, it's been being actually developed by uh, a number of startups as a, a building insulator at the moment. The beauty is it grows very fast and it grows at room temperatures uh, and pressures and it will grow um, and bind whatever it grows on. And we can grow, we can grow it on waste materials. So typically uh, we grow it on things like um, uh, wood chips or, or, or sawdust. Um, we also grow it on coffee grounds. So we went through a period when the coffee shops were open of going around Costa and, and, um, uh, and uh, um, Starbucks. I don't know whether this is apocryphal, but apparently our mycelium prefers Costa coffee rather than Starbucks coffee, but I don't know whether that's the case or not. Um, and we can grow it within a few days into quite thick mass and material that when we dry out and, and use. The image on the right-hand side is not our work, actually. This is a company in, in um, based in New York called The Living who used this process to, to make these bricks. So these bricks were, were grown. Uh, then they were compressed. So they were, they were actually compressed in order to give them a little bit of strength. And then a, this pavilion structure was built with them to show that they could be used in this way, which is really fascinating. 
So in our group, we we start with um, uh, an, a, a principle that we we took from Louis Kahn. So the the famous architect Louis Kahn um, is often quoted because uh, he also taught architecture as well as um, as uh, uh, whispering. Being he's a brick whisperer, we might call him. So he he would say to his students, "If you're out of inspiration, ask your material what it wants to be." And he started the dialogue. You know, you ask a brick, "What do you want to be, brick?" And then the brick will say, "I want to be an arch." And you carry on the dialogue till you have a building. So in a similar vein, we say to mycelium do you want to be a brick and our principle behind that is that mycelium is a really complex biological material and it has lots of potential that we might not exploit if we think about it in traditional building terms so this is the work of one of my PhD students, Dylan Oscar, who's been built these what she calls robotic growth chambers. So these are growth chambers where we're growing on mycelium composites, but we can quite carefully control the humidity, the temperature, the airflow and other things. And what we see, and that's what you're seeing uh, in the bottom image, is that for different conditions, the mycelial network will grow into different forms, into different morphologies. The important thing there is that it, the different forms of the mycelial network within a material lead you to different material properties. So with mycelium, you can get to from a material which is quite rigid to one which is actually quite flexible, maybe be cushioned. For some materials are quite um, friable, so they're easy to break apart. Others are fairly well, well, well formed. And so um, we can then map those morphologies to these different properties. So you don't just get one material, you get a whole library of different materials from, from similar techniques, dependent upon the environment environment in which you grow them and also the substrate that you use to grow them on. And what's really interesting as well is that mycelium will eat some of the substrate. So they'll off, they'll use that as food, but they'll also act as a binder. So treating the substrate as a, as a, as a, um, um, uh, as a, um, and an aggregate material effectively. And then in other times they'll fuse to the material as well. So they'll actually fuse these aggregates together. They'll come, form parts of the aggregate, but where they're not necessarily distinguishable from the aggregate, but you've got two different materials going on there. And then this is a work of one of my undergraduate students who took that idea and developed, a, made a chair using this casting technique. So what you're seeing there is actually modeled on an Ikea chair. In fact, we used an Ikea chair as the mold. So this is one of these plastic molded chairs you can get from Ikea. And we use that as the mold, or at least Natalia did. She then packs it. Um, in this case, with a combination of wood chips and the, the coffee grounds that I was talking about before, keeps it moist. Seeds of the mycelium. The mycelium then grows and she leaves that for two or three weeks. Then she lifts the material out of the mold, dries it, and you've got a really solid chair actually so you can sit on that it's perfectly stable what's really interesting is that it's a mono while it's a monolithic casting so it's, it's done in one go the the outcome has different material properties to it or has the potential and it didn't quite work fully in this case but has the potential to have uh, different material properties so you imagine the chair that you're sitting on it's probably made of more than one component you've used different that you the designers have used different materials to give you different strengths. So the, the back might offer some cushioning and some flexibility. The legs offer rigidity. You can do that within one cast. So you can have a single cast where you have those different functional properties there. So that's really exciting um, starting point. So um, the, to take that to the next level, we think, well, can we use this as a building method? And believe it or not, our, our great biggest client for this kind of way of thinking is NASA. So we're working on a project with NASA and Monica Lipinska, who's just started a PhD with me, but also who worked for NASA before coming to work with me, who are interested in using this technique as a way of building habitats on other planets. So that might sound kind of crazy, but that's what NASA think about. Um, and they're thinking about scenarios where you can't just go and take a cement mixer with you and a bunch of concrete, um, like Mars, for example, uh, but where you may well take the seeds of mycelium and then use the biomass created by human habitation to begin to develop and expand a colony and use this idea of functionally grading the material to adapt to different conditions. So you may not use this as your only building material. In fact, you wouldn't use this as your own, only building material. But imagine a, a building where the walls could also be used to harvest food, for example. And um, we're also working with mycelium species that offer things like UV protection because they contain melanin, other um, uh, useful uh, protection against those, those things as well. So she started working on some concept designs using this approach. And then we're deriving experiments that break down this approach into different parts and see what just how big we can construct using these methods. 
So that's kind of an exciting project, and we're we're very excited to start then. And NASA have just applied for some funding um, through their their scheme to take that to the next level. So now going to the, the next category, the produced materials. And so um, the one that we're most interested in is known as bacterial cellulose. So cellulose is a material that you'll be very familiar with already um, because it's the basis of wood. So wood being a cellulose lignin a hemicellulose composite. Um, bacteria cellulose is kind of the same stuff, but it's a much purer form. Um, it's uh, grown in interest a lot recently, particularly the design community, because um, it can be seen as a replacement for plastics and leathers. So it can be manufactured in different ways that make it a, a much more biodegradable alternative to plastic, for example. Um, there are lots of different ways, uh, lots of different applications for this. So there are beauty treatments and um, it's used as wound dressing in its uh, hydrated form um, and then in its dehydrated form. So once we've dried it out, we use it uh, it's been used in various products including like high-end music speakers have been using it as a as a, um, a, a as a kind of membrane material and designers have been interested they've been people making jackets and other things with it um uh it it, off, it has some real limitations in that area i have to say but it's it's of interest architecturally less so it's it's quite hard to scale up production um, and it's also quite uh, initially it's it's most of the material the material is quite homogeneous so it, it it's most of the applications you see use fundamentally the same process for manufacture so we want to go beyond those those ways and ultimately scale up and so we we applied for and did one a project that started at the beginning of march to develop a new fabrication technology based on growing this material so what you're seeing on your screen and i'm sorry this video will likely be very stuttery for you this is the nature of zoom but is um at the heart of this this setup is a bioreactor and um, bioreactor just a big chamber that we feed a liquid culture which contains bacteria in a food and that's hooked up to a computer and a projector. So the projector is able to, to project onto the top surface of this bioreactor. So you see the, the food being passed in and running on our computer is a 3D model. So we're going to take a zoom into the bioreactor and you see two types of bacteria there now. So the green rod shaped things are our cellulose producing bacteria and they work by floating on the top of the liquid culture and then producing this dense network of fibers. And they do it very quickly. It appears initially like a skin on the top of the um, on the top of the, the material, and then will thicken up over time. And we can we we believe we can grow it to quite some some thickness. And then we have our white little white bacteria in there. They're E. coli, and we've engineered, or we will have engineered those to be light sensing. So they're able to respond to light by producing a pigment. And then we're projecting light onto the surface of the material. So where we project that light, pigment will form. We then grow the cellulose culture. So it grows and then we change the pattern of light corresponding to the section through our model. So we're, we're now building up this, um, this section. The idea is at the end of it, we'll have the pigment in three dimensions within this pellicle. So we'll dry it, we will it will shrink, we will open it up and we will see inside. So that doesn't sound super interesting. I mean, it's kind of, it is really interesting for us, but just being able to pigment a cellulose pellicle um, is not uh, not necessarily a, a terribly useful thing to be able to do, but it's a proof of concept really, because if we can do it, what we can do is to co-culture our, our, our bacteria with other types of bacteria that produce different sorts of material. So the image I am showing on the right, that kind of diagram. So imagine something a little bit like a printer, but rather than getting printer cartridges, um, you buy a vase of bacteria. And you might have a bacteria, for example, that biomineralizes. So it might leave mineral crystals. Um, and it, we've pro we'll have programmed it to respond to those light patterns. So as we shine light, it will produce mineral crystals where you want to. Or um, an enzyme, for example, it will actually break down the cellulose as you're growing the, the, the cellulose up. So um, an enzyme like cellulase. So we can actually mold, mold 3D mold, um, uh, prints as we're going along. So we create very new sorts of materials that could be functionally graded and could be made to be quite complex for a whole range of different applications. And ultimately we'd like to scale that process up for, for building. So for example, building membranes that we might design and actually grow in situ on site, almost like tissue engineering, but a very large scale to provide canopies and other, other sorts of structure. And my, my PhD student, Sunbin Lee is working on this scale up process, imagining how we might get from, from the core science that we're doing in the lab to something that will work at a much larger scale. 
And this is a really exciting project for us. And we're, we're lucky we've got two years worth of funding to do that proof of concept. So that's the, the um, produced materials. And so the, the, the third in my list is the induced materials. And for that, we're interested in the process of biomineralization. So biomineralization is another biological fabrication strategy that's used a lot in nature. Um, your bones, calcium phosphate, your bones and teeth, calcium phosphate is caused by this process. Um, shells, of course, are an example of calcium carbonate and the control of calcium carbonate to make structural form. Um, the one we're interested in is called MICCP or microbially induced calcium carbonate precipitation. Um, it's already used to some extent in the building industry. Um, Hank on the right hand side there, I'm pleased I've just been in the meeting with Hank. Hank was chairing our, 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 uh, our steering group today, but um, Hank has worked on a, a self-healing concrete using um, microbial spores. So what happens is that uh, these microbes create an enzyme that ultimately, and I won't go into the chemical basis of this, but changes the pH of the environment. Uh, in a calcium rich environment, that leads calcium carbonate crystals to form. And what Hank has done is to develop a type of material that's self-healing. So um, there are little, uh, within the, the, uh, the aggregate of the concrete, there are these little spheres of a food and bacteria spores. They're like seeds for bacteria. When the material gets cracked, and water gets in there, the bacteria come alive, they trigger the process of biomineralization and the cracks will reseal again. And so it's been proven now in, on, on real um, uh, civil engineering uh, tests that this works and makes the material incredibly robust and able to self self repair. And Hank is setting up a company um, working on this material now. The one below is is Ginger Dossier, who's created a company called Biomason, which uses the same approach, but this time to actually create a, an alternative cement. So she mixes the bacteria with an aggregate and the appropriate food stuff, and they cement a solid material at the end of it. In this case, creating bricks. Um, they do so with low energy input. Um, uh, we, yeah, with low energy input and uh, yeah, with, with um, uh, um, in a, potentially a carbon negative way because they take carbon, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in that process. It's not a super scalable process yet, so we won't see it replacing concrete anytime soon, uh, but certainly a, a, an idea that this, this way of making materials might become more prevalent. So the question in our group is how we could make this MICCP process more intelligent. So could we make a material that's able to remodel itself in response to mechanical change in its environment? The influence for this is really the way that bone remodels itself. So um, if you are um, a marathon runner, for example, uh, then the bone density in your shins is gonna be greater because your the, the cells that make your bone um, are responding to the, the repeated mechanical loads by synthesizing more bone material to give yourself, to give more strength in your, in your um, and your bones. Um, so that's our thinking. Can we connect this microbial process to create biosements that will respond to loads? So you have a material, you load it, and where you load it, it reinforces itself effectively. It, it makes more density. So this is a, 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 a long project. So when I first got into synthetic biology, this is the project that I started uh, in the lab initially, and then we've, we've developed as funded projects since. So what you're seeing on the left hand side are two, two images of bacteria. Um, so those little rod things, the green rod things of the bacteria, and they're producing um, a, a protein known as green fluorescent protein, GFP, um, which makes them glow. And uh, so think of it like a light that you can turn on. It makes them glow under UV light. Um, what we've done is to, to search out for genetically sensing, uh, to pressure sensing genes in bacteria. And we discovered that nobody had looked into these before. We actually found quite a number in our species bacteria. Now what we did is to engineer the bacteria so that as we put them under load, they light up. And that shows that our, that our genetics, we call a genetic switch, is able to take input and then give us an output. And then the image below shows again, same sort of bacteria you see the little rod-shaped bacteria, but this time they're synthesizing calcium carbonate crystals. So that roughness you see on the surface are calcium carbonate crystals. So as the material, so, so, and what we've been able to do is to, to start um, designing uh, genetic circuits within the, the bacteria. That means we can turn that process off and on when we want to. So when we, the idea is we connect them together. So as we load them, the process is turned on, we get cement. If we're not loading them, we don't get anything at all. So we have those two systems working independently now. And what we're doing in the next six months, 
hopefully, is to put those systems together and make a single system. A microbe, bearing in mind these are two nanometers across, but within a material we can have trillions of them. So two micrometers across, not two nanometers, two micrometers across, um, but we can have trillions of them, all sensing their environment and responding. We also then try and scale up. So this is the work of my PhD student, Thora, who has been looking at using this biocementation process to make larger casts. Um, and we're very excited at the moment because we're just taking part of the process, but we're, we're hoping that we might be able to get some funding to work with a local company called Bespoke Concrete, who are really interested in using this as a casting method for, for making decorative castings and other things. So the, the process is, is deceptively simple, really. We have a sand aggregate. Um, we then um, create... We, we set that within a mold and then we pump through the mold um, a combination of the uh, we seed the the sand with bacteria we pump through a nutrient and a reactant containing calcium and then over the course of about well in this case it's usually a course of about a week to two weeks we then get a cemented cast left over these things are about the size of bricks we think we can go a lot bigger so we want to be able to cast quite large volumes of material in this way um, but it's quite a complicated process because you're dealing with a living um, cement so uh, you get unevenness you need to think about how you have flow of the liquids through the material and so we've done a lot of work developing these novel casting methods that we're hoping to be able to to scale up in the next year or so the other aspect of this is to develop new computational methods so um, we, we're trying to connect the, the kind of um, uh, modeling that we were doing, say, civil engineering. So looking, for example, at um, finite element analysis to look at forces through a material and connect that to how we know the material bit will behave if it contains our bacteria producing the enzymes that make our material. And so this involves quite a lot of novel computation work as well. And we've been developing some new um, um, some new uh, versions of uh, new new tools for visualization. So our aim in the first instance will be to, to do something like the top right image. So the top right is an odometer. Um, it's being that yellow stuff is a jelly containing a bacteria and we're loading it. And the idea is that as we load it, it will begin to calcify. So as we load it, it will resist the load by calcifying itself and, and becoming stronger. So that's the demonstrator. And we hope to get to that demonstrator this, this, this year, the, the, that would be quite a major breakthrough because that's a very new sort of material, a biologically active material in that way has not been um, demonstrated before. And we're projecting into a future where this might have applications for, for example, civil engineering. So uh, we, one of our, probably our, our, our most far reaching um, imagining of this uh, would be the idea of creating a self-constructing building foundation. So rather than digging your trench, filling it with reinforced concrete, you'd seed the ground with our, um, with our bacteria and the soil itself would respond to the loads placed on it by cementing itself and, and creating a self-constructed raft. So this is just to say we've published quite extensively in this area. So this is the, the project that I've published more on than anything else. A lot of it's still concept work. We've got a lot of individual bits of science going on at the moment. We're just getting to the point now where we can pull them together to make our, our demonstration. And we're really excited by that. So my final classification of materials is um, uh, are known as hygromorphs. So these are so just to re re just to recap, uh, these are active materials. So they're materials where we use a living cell to give our material an additional functionality. So we're interested in these hygromorphic materials. So materials. Uh, are hygromorphic if they respond to water by changing their shape. So if you live in a reasonably old house uh, with wooden doors that have warped and don't fit anymore, uh, the chances are that's because the wood has absorbed water, they've, they've changed their shape and then they no longer fit into their frame. So usually this idea of wood warping is something we don't we don't like, we don't want to happen. Um, but some enterprising um, academics, uh, again, University of Stuttgart, the same group I referred to earlier, um, has developed materials that uh, use this warping to uh, an interesting effect. So the, the image you see on the top right is the uh, hygromorphic pavilion, it's called, or hygroskin pavilion. So there's little flaps that you see opening and closing are actually wood composites. So they're very thin sheets of wood that are then, um, which, are, which are an active material. So these will expand in 
contact with water and they've applied them to a substrate of a um that is not uh, hygromorphic so it won't expand uh, towards i mean in this case it's probably a, a resin or plastic backing and then what happens is that as one layer expands so if it gets damp for example if it rains one layer will expand and push the other layer so you get differential expansion and you get this change um, and that can be used to open and close flaps so it's essentially it's an actuator and a sensor all in one. And it's been demonstrated, actually, and we've had some experiments running in Newcastle. My, my colleague Ben Bridgens and Graham Farmer have worked on versions of this material at work and have been shown to be quite robust. So we've, we've left them outside for, for a year and seen them in all kinds of different weather conditions and monitored them. And they can be made to be quite robust. But they're quite slow acting um, and uh, they're not super sensitive either. So they tend to respond to wetting and drying. We're working with a similar sort of material, but this one uses ba bacteria spores. So bacteria are the seed form for the back uh, of, of a bacteria. I mentioned those before. Um, uh, they're incredibly hygromorphic, so they'll expand and contract in response to water. They're tiny, but we can make solutions of trillions of them that we can then apply to a surface. So we, um, we've we developed our methods um, based on some work that uh, was done at Columbia University, the paper I'm, I'm referencing here, uh, where we apply them to a surface of a latex. So we apply to the surface of a latex, and then we have these little mini actuators, and they're incredibly sensitive to slight changes in humidity, so they can adjust themselves in response to the, the humidity in the air. So our process here is to start by thinking about how we can program these materials by applying the spores onto the surface of the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, latex in different patterns. We can also program by building up different layers of spores. So we've worked out that we can, by adding layers of spores up, we can make the program respond more or less to, um, to these changes in humidity in the environment. And um, we're also trying to then scale up and make them robust. I'll just show you this video again. It will be a bit, probably a little bit jerky for you guys. But this is uh, sped up by about four times. So we've gone from a, a humid environment into a dry environment. And you just see it folding up. And then we can connect that a little bit like origami pieces, but where the, the pieces can start to fold up and open and close on their own, depending on the ambient humidity. The scale for this is about two centimeters for, for that one of those strips. So we can scale to the next level. And then we, we, what we want to do and what we've been working actually with our students in studio with is to try to turn this into a building system or building systems to think about how we could scale that up. And this is one of my favorite um, examples of a project for the past few years. Uh, Vincent designed uh, the sort of interior membrane of a, of a dance studio. So the idea being as the dancer moves around and generates humidity and body heat and so on, they actually, the, big, the, the, the walls begin to flex and change and open up apertures and begin to move which is a really interesting idea. And, and I think we're getting closer to being able to produce a, a prototype that begins to demonstrate that, that potential. And we could see it being used in the context of a building that might sweat. So another example uh, idea that we've had is to put it in bathrooms and have tiles that begin to open up as you, you have a shower to allow ventilation through and then close when you finish. And we've got some cool ideas that we're hoping to apply in the own, our experimental building in the next couple of years. So that was a whistle stop tour through four um, material types. I could have talked at length about some of those and, and introduced more, but um, just to say that what we're wanting to do is to, to, to bring all of these things together. So that's the next step. Um, so we want to be able to actually make systems where a lot of these different materials and technologies are brought together in a, in a different way. Just to give you a little heads up on what we're working on at the moment. So this is a grant application I'm working on um, for bringing together these different manufacturing techniques into one place. So imagining a kind of factory environment where we can make material at scale it in an integrated way so we can we can make the material work in different um we can make a materials in the factory setting that are functionally graded that might make use of our cellulose that might make use of our biomineralized materials and so on and make building components from it and we think the way to do that is to bring different microbes together and make new sorts of bioreactor and digital fabrication unit we've also been de dealing with new kind of materials and so on so so this is a, a an example of um uh, a garden uh, a, a concept project that I'm working on called the garden bridge which uses this as a or the gardened bridge I'm sorry which uses this as a concept for making a, a structure and that's just a, a sneak preview of something that I'm going to um, produce very shortly 
So in answer to can we grow a building, the answer is obviously no. <laughs> we may never get to that point, but uh, the combination of these different approaches might enable us to make really interesting materials in interesting ways and and, um, and ways that are self-assembled and, and complex and um, but done at very low energies um, in, in very new sorts of ways. Um, I wasn't sure what what my my time limit is. I have an extra bit of the presentation that I can take you to a, a slightly different part of um, our our research, if you would like, or I can stop now if you would prefer. I'm not sure how people feel. Should we keep going? Okay, so I've got another maybe another five ten minutes, but I just wanted to reflect a little bit on our on the current situation that we find ourselves in. Maybe talk about one of the other themes. So the other theme is the microbial environments theme. It's not the theme that I lead, but it's one that I, is increasingly occupying my attention. I think this might be of interest to, to, to everybody, really. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're interested in technology or not. This is quite important. So when we put in the bid, we set up the microbial environment theme because um, what we were, were aware of is that there's a growing literature on the relationship between the microbiome of our environment and human health. So there's something known as the hygiene hypothesis. And so the hygiene hypothesis is the idea that uh, we've been cleaning far too much and that children in particular brought up in very clean environments, particularly urban environments, tend to have higher instances of things like childhood allergies and so on. And the children brought up on farms or with lots of animals around them tend to do much better health wise. And so we need to think more carefully about the microbial environment when we design our buildings. And we, we kind of threw in, and that might include viruses and other things that are quite important to the way that we use spaces. So that was two years ago. And then last year, we know everything that happened. So what happened was that as part of that theme, we bought all of this sequencing kit. So um, uh, we, we have these very expensive devices that are able to sequence bio, uh, biological cells so they can tell you what the DNA is in biological cells. Because we had one of the latest versions of this kit in the country, we, already, we, we very quickly became a node in what's known as the COG network. So when you hear that there's been a new variant of the disease, that there is this new uh, mutation that's leading to... to bad health outcomes for people. It's because uh, um, our group, uh, well, uh, the group at, uh, led by Darren Smith at Northumbria University, who's part of our hub, or somewhere in part of the, the COG network has found this new variant and is tracking it. So we sequence an awful lot of the positive cases for COVID-19. What this creates is a huge database of um, of uh, viral transmission. And so, and bear in mind, I'm not the expert in this area. What Darren and his colleagues tell me is that um, this level of granularity is so good that it, in some cases you can actually trace the, the path of the, the, um, uh, the disease through individual um, uh, buildings. So you can actually look at hospitals and see, for example, the transfer of patient to patient as they've gotten COVID-19. Um, because there are point mutations. So there are point mutations in every single uh, new viral infection that give it essentially a, a distinctive family tree. We're generating huge amounts of this data, not only at Newcastle, but across the country. And this provides us with an incredible insight that we've never had before. And this is going to be form the basis of research for years and years to come. The other thing that we've seen is the development of new, of, of the rapid development of sequencing technology as well. So, you know, if you've been... Yeah, you know, we've all come up, come up through this kind of world of computers where I will tell my children that the same thing that we do on our mobile phone is the thing that used to take a whole room of the basement of a building. Well, sequencing technology is a little bit like that. So to say, sequence the genome of an individual bacteria, so 20 years ago, might have taken five major labs internationally, 10 years and multiple millions of pounds to multiple hundreds of million pounds to do. The thing that you see there is an Oxford Nanopore sequencer. So Oxford Nanopore, one of our project partners, that's the size and shape of a USB stick. It sticks into the side of your computer and it will do sequencing for you. Good enough to tell you what organisms you have living in your room. And this has been, the, these sequences have been used uh, to do a lot of the rapid testing that we've seen. So we're seeing a huge change in sequencing technology. And that, that sequencing technology is a bridge between the biological world and the physical world. So imagine, for example, a building that was able to detect a virus before anybody, anyone else was able to do it through, through, through um, a, a sensing system that was rather like a fire alarm for you, right? So these things are increasingly possible or have the, the potential to be possible in the near future. 
So we've started to really rethink um, our relationship to biology through COVID-19. So, so what we've started to realize is that we're connected, we're interconnected through this biological network of viruses, of microbes. We're also aware from our research that biological cells can sense things in the environment that are very hard to do using digital sensors. They're also carriers of information. So what is a viral network, if not a social network? It's a, it's a map of social contacts between people. So well before we had Facebook, viruses were social networks, whether we like them or not. And they're also incredibly robust. So they don't need any input from us to survive other than uh, the hosting in our bodies quite often or in the environments that we create for them. And they're intimately connected to, to health and well-being. So we think a major direction for architecture, building uh, buildings and engineering in the future is going to be taking into account this biological environment that I think we've taken for granted for too long and we can't afford to do anymore. So something we're beginning to think of, and it's it's just a, a, an opening thought, really, but is it to think about an Internet of Biological Things, to think about how the sensing that we already do in the environment for things like pollution and um, traffic flow and um, and all the domestic sensors that are around us, whether we like them or not, in our mobile phones and other things, also need to be connected into this biological world in, in new ways. And so um, we're thinking of a future built environments that are, are biologically enabled. And we think this is really the frontier for the research that we're, we're going to do over the next decade. So that was the extra little bit. I have a little bit on the end, just in case we have the time. Just to say that, I mean, I'll take questions now, of course, but um, we have a website for the, the hub, the bbe.ac.uk, where we've got quite a lot on the different projects that we're working on. My old research group also is Symbio.Construction. We kept it very up to date and up until last year, but it has quite a lot of information on some of the projects and we've got some videos and things. I tend not to show very many videos in Zoom calls because they never work super well, but you can go and you actually see some of our stuff live and see people making things and, and see some of the, the work that we've done. And I'm, I'm always happy, of course, to take people sending me emails about random stuff I've, I've just had an email from someone at the bbc who works for a, a forensic science drama show about whether they can use biomineralization as part of a murder scene which is fascinating so i take all all questions and try to give back the best answers that i can so yeah that that's the end of my my presentation i can end my show there maybe maybe stop my screen share as well Well, lovely. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, fantastic. Uh, so do, um, do we have any questions? Yes, John, is it? Let's see. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. The, uh, the, the materials are obviously biodevelopable, de develop, developable, I made a word up. Are they also biodegradable? Uh, so some are, yeah. I mean, so this is one of the thing. The, the actually, the, the greater challenge that we have, John, is that sometimes they're a bit too biodegradable. <laughs> so if you kind of if you're building a building out there, you, you don't want it to biodegrade too quickly. That's going to be an issue. The the big cell of the um, cellulose based materials over, for example, plastics, is that they are very biodegradable. So there are lots of enzymes that can break them down. Um, the other thing ab about the materials they're programmable. So we we there is the potential that we can um, add in agents that we can trigger using some very simple chemical process that will begin that biodegradation process down. The biomineralized stuff is harder to deal with. You know, mineralized materials generally are not necessarily biodegradable. So uh, but then we are looking to develop those for real longevity. So we're not interested in them being thrown away materials, particularly. Um, the, the, um, interestingly, the, the mycelium materials are quite hard to deal with. Uh, one of the reasons why, so we were approached by a, um, a mushroom farmer um, who, who will plant the mushrooms in bags usually. And then he gets this real solid mass of stuff. And it's not like you can just kind of replow it in the way that you might, you know, for the remnants from carrots or what not, and you replow it into the ground, it just kind of rots back down and you've got your, your, you, you the future compost. It's, it's, it's really hard to deal with. So we can take it away. If we can do something with that mass and make it into something, then he's really happy because he gets rid of his waste and we can make it into something. 
But yeah, all of these processes, the theme I didn't talk about is our building metabolisms theme, which is dealing with exactly that. So it's also biological processes that can break down things as well. And so a project I didn't talk about is that we're working with enzymes that can break plastic down which is really exciting so so we're, we're hopeful that um for example i'm imagining the future compost bin where you you um like the super compost bin where you don't just put all your food waste in it you put your plastic bottles in it and then after a couple of months it's all rotted down into to smaller molecules and and, and it's food for something else biologically that's possible so that there are enzymes that will now break down plastic and there's a great the center called the enzyme innovation center that we're starting to work with that do this kind of work um so yeah the, the idea is to see these as part of a whole material life cycle where the biology might make them but the biology also might break them down thanks martin fascinating excellent uh, any, anyone else yeah can i just um, it, that was really exciting, but also a bit terrifying as well, really. You know, <laughs> the shades of Jurassic Park come to mind. You know, uh, there's no danger of these things going off and doing their own thing, is there? You know, they build in a living house that might decide to move, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not our living site. It's pretty heavy, to be honest. But, but no, it's a fair question. And so th there's... There is a simple and a complicated answer to the, the question, David. One of the, so there is a genuine, and I don't think completely unfounded concern about g genetic modification of anything. I think you, oh. you can call it the Jurassic Park um, fear, if you like. The work, the systems that we work with are, are pretty straightforward and pretty simple, and the microbes that we work with are, are, are all pretty safe. So the, the we work with a, a species called Bacillus subtilis, um, which uh, you will, if you have a salad sandwich, uh, you'll eat quite a lot of, whether you know it and like it or not. It's part of your life. We work, also work with a an E. coli. Now, you'll have you'll have come across E. coli in a very bad light because it's generally associated with, yeah. with food poisoning. But we use a type of bacteria, E. coli, a species of bacteria, which lives happily in your gut and is actually very useful to you. When you start to genetically modify things, I think there's an, an, a question about whether you, you bring genetically modified organisms into the environment and you let them loose. Yeah. Now, it's not like dinosaurs in that sense, <laughs> but uh, bi biology evolves and it changes, right? So, so yeah. you start with is not necessarily what you end with. And so quite a lot of our focus is on replacing processes that can happen within clean and safe environments. So genetically modified bacteria, for example, are used a lot in the chemical production industry, but they're used within environments where you, you, you keep them enclosed. They're in labs or factory settings where those, uh, they're kept within bioreactors. And we also have safety measures. So you can add in what are sometimes called kill switches into the bacteria. So you, you, they have to be fed a very, very specific compound or they, they're not able to survive outside the bioreactor. When we get to environmental applications, if you, if you see my example of the, the living uh, the kind of self-constructing building foundation, you would have to seed them in the soil. So they have to become part of the environment. And I think that's where we may find some barriers legislatively, ethically, we would have to think very carefully before we took that route. So I put it there as a provocation, uh, but it's something that we think about quite a lot. And I should say within the hub, uh, one of our priority hires was um, a social, in our case, a social anthropologist who who's also has a background in areas like bioethics. So to think about the application of what we do and what really the limits of what we should and shouldn't do with our technology. So there's nothing really to be fearful of, I don't think, in what we're doing, but there are definitely ethical lines that I think we wouldn't want to cross and broader conversations that I think society would want to have with itself before some of our technologies came on stream. So it's a fair question and it's actually variations of that. One of the questions I do get asked quite a lot by, by people, um, particularly members of the public as well, when we're doing some demo stuff, who are very aware of those kind of the Frankenstein nature, <laughs> of what we might do, which is, uh, yeah, definitely causes some concern. Lovely. We've uh, got a question from YouTube. Um, how could global buildings be prevented from rotting or, or being consumed? Maybe just yeah, or, or indeed getting disease. 
<laughs> yes, get, get, they get they get your house gets a virus. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think there's a, a a line I would draw that we we've not yet crossed between um, growing the materials, but then effectively at the end of the fabrication process, the material is usually killed or dried, right? So so the mycel the the mycelium stuff we dry it and we we leave it now. It does have the potential potential to come back to life again. And an interesting problem is that, of course, mycelium is actually dry rot in buildings. So if you've got mycelium living in your house, you don't think, "Oh, great, my house is growing itself." You think, <laughs> oh my God, the floorboards are going to break up. So, so there is the, there is that potential for life again. But generally, you know, with the cellulose materials as well, we will dry them, treat them, so that they they are effectively inert by the time we finish. With the active materials, um, the spores that you see are spores, they're seeds for the bacteria. So they're not, they don't have metabolism, they don't, they don't grow. They retain the potential for life, but it's very unlikely in the conditions that we give them, they would be able to come back to life. And in fact, we can also tweak with their genetics as well to turn off that capacity to regerminate. So, um, so generally, we, the materials that we're using at the moment, there will come a point where we, we take them and they, they, they're effectively killed or they're, they're um, taken away. That doesn't mean to say that we don't have the ambition to use living, living materials, so materials that would retain life and would go on to live past, their, uh, um, past the, that first construction phase. To do things like self-heal or, or grow, expand, you know, a house that might grow itself, that would be an interesting idea. Um, and in truth, I don't know what the answer to that question is. I mean, it, it, it would be a challenge to have a growing building and not to have it attacked by other species. Um, so one of the things that we do a lot in the lab is that we we take uh, microbes, for example, that are, usually exist with lots of other microbes. And because of that, living in a community, they're very robust. And then we take them and refine them. We take one species and we cultivate those species particularly. You stick those back into the environment again, and they're not very happy because they're then attacked by other species and they don't have their for want of a better word, their mates around them to, 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 to support them. So one of the principles that we're starting to think about is the development of multimicrobial systems. So where we, we give that, that kind of quorum um, uh, um, benefit, so that the micros are benefiting one another. So some of them are defending against enemies, others are metabolizing things that perhaps the other microbes can't metabolize. This is a really interesting area of, of research. It's very complicated to engineer, a really complicated to engineer, but, but that leads to plenty of research papers, right? So, it, so we, we don't worry about that too much, but yeah, that's, but I don't have a good question to that. And it is a good question. Excellent. Uh, is there anyone else? Is that uh, David? I've heard about them developing technology to go to Mars to kind of send out before the humans go to start building the resources that uh, they can then mm. use when they arrive. Uh, are there any thoughts about how well this would work on a, an, another planet? Yeah, so I mean, this is not my main area of, of expertise. And so we, we've talked to, with NASA about this, and there are various different scenarios that are put together in this regard. So one is that we'll send out robot, initially we'll send out robotic probes that will land much in the same way that the Mars lander that you saw, I, I've got its name now, but landed recently. Um, but rather than just simply retrieving samples, it will begin to start um, collecting together raw materials. Um, NASA are working on an idea of uh, essentially that there's a, a multi-step process where you, you would send probes initially to begin to gather together raw materials. You then send a, a crew, um, a, 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 a a crew of astronauts who would land and essentially inhabit the vehicle that they land in, but then will begin to expand that vehicle by making use of local resources. And so the mycelial stuff that we're doing is part, part of that idea that you might take the kind of seeds for the mycelial growth. Um, if you've got enough that you can start create biomass, so you can start to grow things, then you grow things, you create biomass from that growth, you begin to then generate a material, great insulator or whatever, you begin to expand your habitat. So, so something that, um, that Monica is working on is the idea of a habitat that will begin to unfold over time. So you would begin to grow new bits of it. Um, and that might use a combination of uh, the biomineralization approaches as well to, to solidify. So I wrote a paper on this about how you might use biomineralization to make um, essentially as a cement in a Mars-like environment. 
um, it's 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 there were a lot of unsolved problems to think about. Like it's hard enough thinking about how you're going to keep humans alive without all of these biological systems as well. It's super cold as well, but that's in some ways that's a benefit. So if you can create mycelium materials and then freeze them and you've got something that's quite strong as a structural material, for example. So there are payoffs and there are lots of different concepts about how to do this and NASA are investing in a number of different versions, some of which involve biotechnology, some of which involve other the thing so they're spreading their bets a little bit lovely anyone else no well then steve there we are yes absolutely wonderful well uh it leaves it to me to uh, call upon uh, you andrew to uh, to give a vote of thanks here well uh Yes, thank you very much for that, Martin. Uh, it really was an absolutely fascinating overview of what, what looks like a very sort of uh, fruit, fruitful, <laughs> complex yet rewarding topic, I'd say, with uh, plenty, plenty of real world applications. Um, sort of the, the, the way you went through the, the four different types, I particularly liked well, yes, I mean, I, whether or not you're going to rival Ikea um, would, would certainly be interesting. And I, I particularly liked uh, sort of asking your mycelium, would you like to be a brick or what would you like to be? Uh, it's always good to provide opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to, to see what things we'd like to turn out into. You certainly the, going um, to Ikea though, and, and going into shopping, growing your own. That would be the thing when you get a bag <laughs> of seeds in their mold. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would give away my Allen keys for that, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. Um, I, I also very, uh, very much like these. Um, what you said about the cellulose, where it's less three D printing and more three D growth. Um, again, so see what you can do with your IKEA. Uh, certainly, from coming from a geological perspective, biomineralization is uh, always of interest. And um, recently, we, our institute had an inquiry of how. You know, if anyone had any novel ways of dealing with uh, concrete rot uh, in, in civil engineering assets. And so it's um, the potential applications there would, would be huge if, if that could be um, made to work. Um, and as well as the hydromorphic, uh, hydromorphic materials and those different applications with their uh, differential expansion properties as well. Um, and then also as well, the, uh, the range of future work, what sort of... Um, uh, what sort of applications and sort of factory methods you, you might need, uh, but also this biological internet of things um, where we're looking at a uh, really interesting way of sort of, you know, how you can take the a range of complex, um, complex interrelated systems and uh, give them to human benefit in the built environment. So uh, on, on behalf of the Institute, thank you very much. And uh, we certainly look forward to seeing you in person in the future. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would love to see you all in person. So the moment we can actually do this live, I would, I would, I'll be there as a shot. So it was, it was a great honor to be invited and I, I, I enjoyed it. And, and the questions were, were superb as well. So, so um, yeah, spot on. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you found it entertaining. Hopefully, enlightening. Anyway, lovely. Okay, um, there we are. Just again, uh, just a few final notices. Our next NEMI lecture of this type will be in May by uh, Stephanie Glenn Dinning on geotechnical assets. Uh, and don't forget, we'll be sending around further information about our two-day conference with the Durham Energy Institute, and we'll hopefully see you there. So over, uh, I think back to you, Steve, just to close things off. Just to finalise everything. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for attending uh, this evening's lecture, especially Martin. Uh, I think he's given us a heck of a lot to think about there, and we can see a future, there's no doubt about it, with so many different things in the future. Um, so I'm sure everyone will agree uh, it's been a very, very enjoyable and, uh, and informative evening. So uh, we we'll hope to see everyone uh, at our next lecture, which uh, Andrew has just mentioned. So uh, there's nothing else, I think, for us to say other than uh, good night. And thank you very much for attending.